Hello and welcome to News Desk, a conversation that puts you at the very centre. Each week we take a topic that's in the news and with your help, through your comments, through your questions and of course through some very good experts, we try to unpack that topic. My name is Alex Forrest-Whiting. And I'm Melissa Chan. I'll be taking a look at uh, the chat and seeing your comments and questions and bringing them into the conversation. Yeah, so this week we are focusing on Vladimir Putin after yet another election win, that whopping 87% win, which of course is no real surprise given that there was no opposition. They were either banned, they were either dead or they were in exile. So no wonder this election was called a sham election by many. But we want to branch out, not just look at what has happened in Russia, but the effect that that is having on the rest of the world. So this week we are asking how Putin Putin's grasp on Russia is reshaping the world order. So joining us uh, for this uh, discussion is DW's Eastern Europe editor, Roman Goncharenko. Thank you so much for your time. And then right next to him, we also have Dustin Hemmerlein. Hello, he guys. has been, yeah, hi. I know you've been researching and uh, studying up on this topic for us. Yes, I have been. And then opposite is uh, Sherry Chan. She is uh, going to spend a lot of time in chat looking at your comments and questions. And between the two of us, the, the two Chans we've got, uh, <laughs> it, it, we are going to bring in uh, your voices into the conversation. And not at the table, uh, but you'll hear us uh, talking to Michelle Stockman. She's in the control room making everything happen. And later, we'll also be speaking to DW's chief international editor, Richard Walker. He will be looking at the role Russia is playing along with China and with India and asking, is that affecting the global order? So definitely, please post your questions and comments. We're really going to try to get to as many questions as possible. Last time we got a lot of comments. We want those questions as well. Um, if you have anything on Putin and Russia for Roman and for Richard uh, in regards to Russia's relationship with India uh, and Russia's relationship with China. In fact, I have some stuff that's been posted already. I mean, uh, we have at Doc Farai with these laughing emojis with tears saying we can't even call that an election what happened this this past weekend. Uh, the guy just put himself back on the throne. Uh, and we also have at uh, Kryto Rift saying, uh, meet the new boss, same as the old boss. Um, so yeah, uh, comments already. And I, I see it's, it's moving ahead. So that's good. And just to get things going in terms of more engagement, I thought we'd put up a poll. Uh, look, this, to be clear, is, is not a scientific poll. It's just a little bit of fun. Uh, but the question that we want to ask you is, are Russia's warming ties with China built to last? And you have some uh, choices over there. Uh, yes, uh, it is built to last. Uh, uh, Russia and China uh, are ready for a new world order. Uh, or no, it's all about the economy, stupid. That's really why uh, China and Russia are working together the way they are right now. Uh, and then you have a third option option in the poll, which is uh, as long as Putin and Xi are in power, uh, things are going to work uh, between uh, Beijing and Moscow. So uh, take your pick and then uh, we'll get to uh, the results of that poll later. Very interesting what that poll will reveal because um, some good, interesting choices there. Um, OK, so let's just get things started. Dustin, thank you very much for being here, our reporter. Um, you are the person who's going to sort of just very briefly explain why we are talking about this subject today and what the relevance is over the past few days. So take it away, please. Exactly. Let me give you guys the lay of the land when it comes to um, what just happened in um, Russia. So we've just seen the elections on the weekend and a big surprise, um, Putin won the elections and is now, has announced a win with 87% of the vote. And when we uh, announced that we were doing doing this topic in the um, community tab on YouTube, um, a lot of our audience was already um, yeah, telling us, is this really an election? Can we call it an election? And um, yeah, that, that's true. What you are saying is true. Like, uh, there is a big question if an election, um, if we even can call it an election, if like there's no independent um, observers that can really say like, oh yeah, everything went right. Um, and uh, but the question is still is right. Like, what is Putin using these um, uh, using this election for, or why he's why he's even going through the motions of this? 
and for him, um, forcing high turnout for the election was really a main goal to legitimize his like, um, yeah, his reign. And uh, what, how he did that as reports of him, like, uh, or like not him personally, but his government forcing government workers to vote, or like, the, if you're a government worker, your boss might have asked you to like send a screenshot so they know you've actually done the online voting, stuff like that. So there's been reports like that. Um, plus, there's also um, yeah, like a, a lot of other ways, like online voting, that like supposedly should lead to high turnout. The turnout that was reported by the Russian government was 77.4 percent, and I think we also have like we prepared some pictures or like video of what you can see, what it looked like when people were voting in Russia. And what you can see there is like um, there has been, um, uh, despite like him not really having serious opposition. Um, there's still long lines in front of these voting cabinets, and that's because um, the Russian opposition outside of Russia really staged a protest there, and that was their way um, to show that um, you could vote and be in opposition to Putin. By going, all of them went to vote at 12 at noon on Sunday, and this is why there were long lines. Um, and yeah, nothing, as far as we know, uh, big happened to these people who lined up. But it's still like that's an expression of like um, the defiance, um, and this happened, by the way, all around the world. We have more pictures also of like what happened in Berlin. So embassies, Russian embassies, where people could vote, uh, all around the world had like long lines at the same time. Mm. And uh, here in Berlin, actually, um, uh, Yulia Naval Naya, Naya. Yeah, I'm 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 looking like this because I was afraid I would mispronounce his name. <laughs> you said it. Yeah, Yulia Naval Naya, as you can see here, was voting here in Berlin, also in front of the Russian embassy, in a long line where she had to wait for hours to get her chance to to cast her vote. I mean, that's pretty brave because uh, I just kept thinking, go, even the fact that she goes into the embassy is a danger, given Absolutely. that they're so brazen with how they've been going after. Her. The opposition in Russia. Yeah, would she come out? We were waiting. Oh, she would she come, come out, out, but would they have laced her ballot with some weird nuclear, you know, <laughs> residue even? No, exactly. Yeah, it's like it's 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 a powerful thing seeing her vote, you know, and um, yeah, that happened here in Berlin. And but still, like with all of this, you know, opposition happening, in the end, Putin was still able to announce a big win. He did hold like a big. Um, a gathering, a big rally at the Red Square, and he left little doubt in anyone's mind that he is the person in charge in Russia and in charge of the Russian government, and that he, um, like, no matter what the the, the uh, percentage, that he makes sure that he is in charge is what I want to say, and I think that's kind of where we are now. Um, he's really he started his fifth, you know, fifth term in the office, and the question is, like, what are we to expect from this? Thanks so much, Dustin. And while you've been talking, I just want to give a shout out to some of the people participa uh, participating. Uh, David Wilson, shout out to you. And Raptor Hacker, that's a heck of a name. Shout out to you. Thanks so much for participating. Please keep your comments and questions coming. Yep. And if you are just joining, uh, this is uh, called News Desk. We are a DW live stream. And this week we are talking about Russia and we are asking how Putin's grasp on Russia is reshaping the world order. And we can now listen actually to Vladimir Putin on Sunday after those exit polls came in, proving yet again that he had won. Let's just listen to what he has to say in this particular clip. We have many tasks ahead of us, but when we are consolidated, I think it has become clear to everyone that no matter how much they want to intimidate us, no matter who or how much they want to suppress our will and consciousness, no one in history, as I have already said, has ever succeeded at anything of the sort. It has not worked now and will not work in the future. Never. OK, well, let's bring in uh, Roman Goncharenko, who is DW's Eastern Europe editor, listening to that. What did you make of that from what Putin was saying? He's talking a lot about us and them. Who's the us, who's the them? Well, he didn't uh, say anything new for people who watch Russia for a long time. Uh, he basically continues saying it again and again. So he sees Russia as a great power. Um, he sees himself as a great leader someone like um, 
the czars in 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 the form of few in the centuries before or someone like Stalin, the Soviet leader in the 30s, 40s, and 50s. So someone someone who is um, building back. Uh, the Soviet um, Empire, the Russian Empire. I think the comparison with Russia, uh, the Russian Empire, which collapsed in 1917, um, is more accurate than comparison yeah. with the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I think we have to see and analyze this election, uh, or something that they call election in Russia, which I would say was a sham election. But it, it's not the first time that it was like this. Uh, six years ago, as, ago, in 2018, it was the, basically the same. Uh, there was no opposition uh, or fake opposition, you know. Um, there were some candidates uh, picked up by the Kremlin um, to represent or to suggest that there is a um, uh, there is an alternative, whereas there is none. So uh, we have to talk about the elephant in the room, and this elephant is the Russian war against Ukraine. Yeah. So this is why it is important uh, to talk about this election, and that is why how we should see the result. Why um, is Putin so eager to get that kind of acclamation, as some say? Some say it's it's um, electoral monarchy in Russia now, or electoral something of monarchy. the kind. Electoral monarchy—that's a yeah. good phrase. Yeah. Uh, some say it's an electoral event. So any anything but not elections, at least not in the way we see it in the West. So there was no uh, no no. Um, Competing programs, nothing of the kind. Mm -hmm. So it's it's a big show, you know, um, so, so very orchestrated. Um, and it, why why I think it is important for Putin to get such a um, record result, because it is also for him a kind of referendum on this war. Mm -hmm. So okay. look, he can say uh, he can say it to the Russians, but also to the world. Look, people are behind me. I'm waging this war, and they love it. So. So just picking up then on um, the opposition and what Dustin was saying there about um, Yulia Navalnaya being in Berlin. We know that Alexei Navalny was or died um, last month in prison, in an Arctic prison. What of the opposition? Is it pretty much dead or is there something to speak of? Well, um, that's a good question. Um, if we... A look at the prominent figures like Alexei Navalny, who is dead and who was um, probably killed, or at least this is what his wife and his relatives, his close friends believe, directly or indirectly, it doesn't matter at the moment. So he is no longer there and he was probably the, re the reason why Putin was a bit nervous and his whole system of power was nervous before the selection. Why? Because. Alexei Navalny is someone who staged or played an important role. He was not the only one, but he played a very important role um, at the elections in 2012, when Vladimir Putin returned to Kremlin. Uh, he was prime minister for four years between 2008 and 2012, because the Russian constitution wanted him to go. So there were, um, in the, according to the Russian constitution, you could only be president for two terms, just like in the United States. Uh, so he, he went, but uh, he basically remained in power, controlling all the major, major trips. And, and um, the president, Medvedev, a close ally of his, who was prime minister and then became president, was they just roles warming, effectively, warming a seat for him. And then he returned, but people didn't want that. A lot of uh, Western-oriented liberal Russians protested against it in the year uh, 2011, 2012, in, in the winter, we saw something we haven't seen in, in Russia for, for many, many years, like dozens of uh, thousands of people, nearly 100,000 in Moscow. Well, we have to, of course, say that M Moscow is not Russia. Russia is a big country mm -hmm. with over 140 million people. But still, it was something very dangerous. And Putin looked weak at that moment. So when he returned to power, he was trying to make sure this will never happen again. So he tightened up the grip on opposition. Uh, the, the process he started long before that. And then he made sure that Alexei Navalny had no chance. So um, he was in prison. But still, uh, even being in prison uh, or in a colony uh, um, far, far away from Moscow, Alexei Navalny managed to send messages through his friends, through attorneys, 
And that is why um, in a times of war, this is the first time um, thing like a big election, this acclamation of Vladimir Putin took part against the background of this war with Russian casualties being enormous. So this is the biggest casualties after the Second World War in Russia. And remind us those numbers again. Those numbers are, um, according to some estimates, uh, at least 300,000 wow. killed and wounded. Mm -hmm. yeah. So killed in action and wounded. Uh, that's a very big figure. Officially, there were 15,000 uh, Soviet people, uh, Soviet soldiers killed in the Afghanistan war, uh, which was nearly 10 years long. Yeah. Uh, official. So maybe those figures are higher, but just to give you a comparison, this is much, much bigger. And of course, Russia is a big country, as I've just said, yeah. and uh, Russia um, has um, a lot of um, ability to absorb those shocks, mm -hmm. uh, war shocks, like uh, people being killed, the economy not working the way it used to. But uh, Russia was able to absorb those shocks, but still, Putin was not sure how will this go, mm -hmm. because people are not happy with this war. Let's let's be absolutely clear about mm -hmm. this. They are not. There is a, a nucleus of uh, Putin voters. We don't know exactly how many. Some say 20 percent, some say 30 percent, but it's a minority. It's a huge minority, but still it's a minority who want this war to continue, who want this war to um, just to, to uh, want Russia to occupy all of Ukraine, maybe Moldova, another form of Soviet Republic. So just to get back, get the Russian Empire back. This is basically what it's all about. Uh, but this is a minority. There is a um, huge part of Russians who are passive, who are afraid, but who just want stability. So they want this war to end. And we can assume that uh, the longer this war continues, that the number of people who want this war to end will be growing. Yeah. That's why it was important for Putin to show, look, they all support me whatever I do. But well, just, so I'm just sorry, very quickly, but just going back to that question about the opposition now, I mean, so what are you saying about that actual opposition? Yeah. Many of whom we know are in exile. Sorry, I don't want to, lie, um, it, to talk okay, about it too um, much because I want to yeah, talk about Putin. Yeah, let's, but let's... but is, uh, is it still a threat, even if it's outside, or is it just what we saw on Sunday, this noon uh, rally against Putin, people turning out, but that's pretty much as far as it goes? Well, in short, I see no danger for Putin coming from any opposition figure at the moment in Russia. So there could emerge someone, um, but this will take definitely time. Because, uh, well, we are talking about years, probably. Uh, because he has um, tightened his grip, he has nearly everything under control. The only moment when he was, um, when his chair was um, shaking was um, in June 23, when a, um, well, yeah. I, would, I don't know how, <laughs> how to describe this guy. He's uh, such an interesting personality. You know who I mean. A yes, character. Do. Yeah. I will say it in my bad um, Russian, Prigozhin. Is that yes. correct? Yes, yeah, Prigozhin, yeah. yeah. Yevgeny Prigozhin, who used to be a criminal. And uh, a chef. Uh, and and a chef. used to be a, uh, they call him Catering Putin's chef. cook. Yes. Because he was running a um, um, restaurants. Uh, he has, has a lot of businesses and a lot of mm. head a lot of businesses and uh, interests. And uh, one of those businesses was a mercenary company called the Wagner Group, yeah. uh, which was basically um, um, established 10 years ago when uh, the, this war we are talking about um, actually started with the annexation of Crimea just 10 years ago in March uh, 2014. And um, this is when Prigozhin came uh, in his new role uh, he helped Putin wage that uh, clandestine war in eastern Ukraine because Russia was denying that it was involved. It was just sending weapons, it was sending instructors, officers, uh, but no regular army. So Putin was saying, we are not involved. But of course he was. He was just denying that, the obvious thing. Um, and Prigozhin was, was very helpful. So he um, helped uh, Russia to establish that kind of rule and from that uh, point, uh, he could then invade mm -hmm. Ukraine openly with his army. So he, 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 just imagine eating an apple. You cannot swallow an apple at a time. Mm -hmm. 
Ukraine is a big country. It's, it's the second largest country in Europe after Russia. It's bigger than France, bigger than Germany. Mm -hmm. So you cannot invade it in, in a moment. It's just impossible. Mm -hmm. So Putin um, made a smart thing in his view. First he took Crimea, uh, then uh, he digested it. He established control, he armed the peninsula. It took years. He redeveloped his econ uh, economy. We will talk about that. Uh, and then he established that grey zone in, in Donbass, in that uh, coal mining region in eastern Ukraine, uh, where he basically formed an army. And with that army and with his regular army, he invaded then in 2022. So he, it was already his third piece of Ukraine that he uh, sw tried to swallow in uh, two years ago. But uh, just to finish it up, because it's an important question about opposition, Prigozhin, was, became an opposition figure. And he was talking like Alexei Navalny. Mm. He was posting uh, a lot of videos. Uh, he was a guy who loved to be filmed, saying some brutal things, mm -hmm. criticizing the uh, defense minister and the head of the general staff of the Russian army. Something unimaginable, actually. And Putin never saw that coming. Yeah. So uh, right out of the blue, there comes an ally, um, some say maybe even a friend of Putin's, and turns against him. Although Prigozhin was not directly criticizing Putin, but he was criticizing his defense minister, who is a very close friend of Vladimir Putin, the president. So it was something Putin never expected. And he saw very weak on the day of that, um, um, what they call it, march on Moscow. Yeah. Because Prigozhin started um, with a group of uh, uh, his, his soldiers, heavily armed a march on Moscow. And they, they were able uh, to take the city of Rostov, which is a huge, uh, a big city uh, close to the Ukrainian border. Uh, and they controlled the city practically. There was no resistance. I mean, so what you're saying is, the, in, in answer to Alex's question about the opposition, not exactly what we were thinking of in terms of an answer. We were thinking of yeah. a liberal sort of replacement for Navalny. And you're saying that, frankly, the most serious opposition uh, against Putin was this this bid from Prigozhin, who yeah. uh, many people thought if he did uh, become a leader would be even worse than, than put Putin. I mean, it's just uncertain. Um, so that is not a great situation. I just want to take the opportunity to share some of the comments coming in um, because it seems like a lot of people definitely uh, question these elections in big quotation marks. Um, Alex, we have um, at WC8246 saying, is anyone even allowed to run against him, Putin? Or did they all fall out of windows? Uh, so that's one comment. And then Amber P is saying, it's sad for Russia to have the same dictator for decades using the D word. Um, Omi Yadav is saying that Putin elects Putin to rule Russia. So a lot of people seeing through the farce of the election, although somebody else, Anne McNeil, is saying, I certainly don't support Putin, but it takes two to tango. I'm not sure who the other partner in the tango is in that comment, but, um, you know, some people willing to um, explore the fact that the election perhaps was uh, a little bit more complex um, in, in that way. And Hip Hop Guru, who I gave the shout out to earlier, has a question. What exactly was their choice? All the real oppositional politicians were not allowed to join the election. I think it's a rhetorical question uh, at best. And, and last thing to say on my end, I was actually in Moscow in 2012 as a reporter. So I do remember that that moment. We were together there because I was there as well. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, and and I, I covered the Pussy Riot trial. Do you remember like when, uh, when um, that, that was amazing and it was a very different time in, in Russia? Absolutely. It's, um, Russia is not the same and the world is not the same anymore. Um, it was the first time that uh, I saw a lot of army lorries and soldiers on the mm. streets of Moscow. So Putin was, was definitely afraid at that moment that he had not the complete control of the situation. Yeah. Mm. I don't think he was really in danger of losing p power at that time in 2012, but um, he was nervous. You could see it, you could feel it in the air. And um, he, he did his homework. And let me just ask you, um uh, one more question about um, Putin before we do move on. How would you describe his rule over the last 24 years? It's a long time. What would you describe President Putin as? That's a difficult question. Uh, before I respond, um, just maybe one brief remark about the opposition. Um, it is always under control who is running. 
So it's never someone uh, who says, I want to run, and then he's allowed or her, she is allowed to run. So we saw um, uh, one candidate, a woman, who tried to run. Oh, she yeah. was not registered. Um, then there was this candidate, Nadezhdin, who was, some say, actually um, part of the game that Kremlin is trying to play every time there is a presidential election. So there is someone who is playing the role of a liberal opposition for those who try to vote and so though um, just giving a, an opportunity to let the steam off, you know. Um, um, and uh, at every election there is such a person. Yeah. Well, there was. This time not. Because yeah. they saw when, when, they, when they tried to put Nadezhdin in that role as a kind of a liberal opposition opposing the war, there were queues of people yes. trying to sign up for him. Yeah. And there were so many of people trying to sign up for him that the Kremlin um, had a feeling that maybe this could spiral out of control. So he had Something to go. that happened in uh, countries like Belarus, mm -hmm. where there was this uh, wife of a candidate, the candidate himself couldn't run, but she was then lent, uh, led to run. Uh, I'm talking about Svetlana Tikhanovska. Yeah. And then this gave, of course, people the feeling that, hey, there is an alternative, we can vote for her. Yeah. Uh, so the Kremlin didn't want to play that game. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, just are you able to sum up 24, yeah. 24 years of rule <laughs> I'll try, of Putin? I'll try, because I mean, it's... quite quite succinctly, but yeah, you know, what um, stands out for you particularly about him? Uh, what stands for me? Um, well, he came, um, and I, I would probably disagree with some, some analysts and experts who say that Putin has changed, that he has evolved, that he came as a Democrat and then he was kind of... Um, frustrated because his hand was not shaken by the West, you know, and the West, um, well, did things that he didn't like and then he turned his back and, and said, okay, I'm walking away. Um, I don't see it that way. I think he was from the very beginning, even before he became president. He comes from the KGB, yes? Yeah. That secret service in the Soviet Union, which is very famous. I think famous. we have, even have a picture of him in the KGB. Uh, yeah. We have to always look at, at his background. He comes from Leningrad, uh, the, which is St. Petersburg today, in the second largest city in Russia, in the north. Um, and uh, it's, it used to be, it was... There's a, there's a picture It used to be him. Russia's window to Europe, actually, yep. when it was uh, founded by Peter the Great. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, Putin grew up in, in very poor uh, uh, family, working uh, hard um, and just like many Soviet people, but he was romanticizing the, uh, the secret services, the KGB. So he wanted to become one. And um, he used to fight. He was um, in, in, in the poor parts of, of, of St. Petersburg where he grew up. It was okay to fight just as a kid. And this is something that uh, made very, um, that formed his character. Uh, he, he, he quoted uh, that episode, uh, or he said it many times, if, if you, you cannot avoid a fight, you should strike first. Mm -hmm. uh, this is Vladimir Putin. Yeah. So he did, he, it, uh, he did it as a teenager, as a kid in, in, in Leningrad in the Soviet times, and he, he does it again now uh, against the West, because he believes the, the fight is inevitable. He believes he's, his country is, a, is a, in a fight with the West, Mm -hmm. So he has to do something about it and he has to strike first because he cannot compare the resources of the West and Russia. Uh, the West has much more resources militarily, economically, it's much more powerful. Um, then uh, this KGB years formed him, of course. And that experience of the Soviet Union collapsing in the 80s, when he was actually based in Eastern Germany, in Dresden, um, as a Secret Service officer, he saw the Berlin Wall go down. Mm -hmm. He saw how how helpless the um, uh, government of Eastern Germany looked, uh, though many believed it was solid as a rock. So it was for him a double blow. First, the GDR, as a German Democratic Republic, collapsed, and then the Soviet Union collapsed. It was a shock for him and um, from, for many people like him, but um, it, it, some believe that he kind of embraced democracy. I don't know. I'm not sure. No. Um, a lot of people pretended that they embraced democracy, but then yeah. they secretly hoped for the return of the Soviet uh, uh, power in, in whatever disguise, or it's not called Soviet Union anymore, it's called Russia, but and there is no um, communist party, but there is a similar party, United Russia.
for, for the Kremlin. Um, and then um, I think in the 90s there was a signal when he was from him uh, when he was in Hamburg. Hamburg and Leningrad were the partner cities and um, uh, someone from, from the Baltic states was speaking and criticizing Russia and the Soviet Union. And Vladimir Putin, it was 1994, I believe, it was, it's a very famous episode uh, which describes Vladimir Putin very precisely. He just stood up and walked out. Everybody sitting there shocked. Mm -hmm. uh, um, um, and this is what Vladimir Putin is. So he, he, he found, uh, he, he's, he's um, very nostalgic about the Soviet Union, about the collapse of the Soviet Union, about the Russian Empire. Uh, there is a mixture of ideology in his head, Russian nationalism, uh, anti-Western rhetoric, anti-Americanism, uh, a lot of things mixed up in his head. But it is very important to understand he is not alone. So it is not just one figure who kidnapped Russia yeah. and the Russian people actually wanted to be friends with the West. This is not the case. There is this big trauma of the collapse of the Soviet Union. There were definitely mistakes being made by the West, uh, especially by the United States in those early 90s um, and, and later as well. And even when he became president in, in, in the early 2000s, uh, just like Iraq war, uh, things that uh, persuaded him uh, that he has to uh, just forget all what was before. And um, what we are seeing now, I think, and what describes Putin for me, summing it up, he is a war president. We can talk and talk about wars that he had. He had a war in Chechnya when he came to power in 1999, then 2000 and a couple of years later. Then there was the war in Georgia, uh, which was a short one, but also very important. It was a test balloon for the West. Then there was this war in uh, Ukraine, which started with the annexation in Crimea in between 2015. Uh, Russia came uh, to help Syria, um, and Putin actually uh, is the guy who um, intervened and uh, used this Syrian war as a training ground for, for the big invasion of Ukraine. And he was open about that. Yeah. He said, well, we are having a very cheap um, exercise field here. Something like that. And then, of course, the big, the big invasion. Ukraine. Yeah. Um, thank you very much, Roman. There's, uh, there's so much that we could talk about, and I wish we could, but I just want to move things on a little bit. Um, thank you for that. If you are just joining us, you're watching News Desk. It's a DW News live stream, and we are talking about um, Putin. We're talking about his uh, latest election win, asking how Putin's grasp on Russia is reshaping the world order. And as well as uh, Roman joining us, we also also, um, have got our chief international editor, Richard Walker, who is joining us down the line. Thank you very much, Richard. Thank you for being patient as we come to you. I do want to just talk to both of you um, about something that you mentioned a little bit earlier, Roman, and that is uh, the Russian economy, uh, particularly the fact that it is doing well, uh, which has surprised many. In fact, the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, has predicted, predicted that it will rise by, uh, to 2.6% this year, more than the US, more than the EU, which is quite astounding. Um, Richard, I'll come to you in a second. Roman, just explain that briefly. How can that be? Um, that the Russian economy is so strong? Yes. Well, we were naive. <laughs> we imagined that, um, and that's my point, we should stop comparing Russia to the Soviet Union. Mm. Because the Soviet Union was a planned economy, so it, it was very, um, it was structured in a different way and it was vulnerable. Russia is a market economy, and we often forget about that. Market economy is much more stable. Uh, look at the West. So we had crisis, but we survived. And that is why we should never forget that Russia is a market economy. It, it, it can handle big shocks better. It's a huge country. It has, um, it a, has very a really good central uh, head of the central bank, right? This woman. She's yes, legendary. Uh, yes, Nabiulina, yes. Uh, Elvira Nabiulina is her name. Um, uh, she is uh, indeed very talented. Mm. So uh, this is part of the, uh, part of the secret. Uh, but not, not the whole of it. Um, the blow of sanctions was hard. The freezing of Russian assets was a shock. Some say it was a nuclear option, actually, yeah. uh, to freeze those uh, assets. Uh, 300 billion more. 
Um, but is it basically the, the, this war economy that, yes. that has kind of this is part <laughs> of uh, this is part Russia. of uh, part of the um, uh, answer to your question? Why? Because Russia started to prepare for this long, long ago. Um, uh, as a journalist, um, I was start. I started to take notes how Russia is preparing for a big war as early as 2013, mm -hmm. before prior to the annexation of Crimea, and there were some some uh, milestones on this way to the big invasion. One of them was in the year 2016, 2017. Vladimir Putin started openly talking about a wartime economy, yeah. uh, which was for me kind of a shocking because uh, hey. There is no big war. What 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 is what is plan what is being planned? And uh, many experts then uh, in Russia itself said that Russia thinks that a big war, probably with the West, uh, could be inevitable in in the twenties. So they start to prepare for that. Mm -hmm. uh, they they prepare their banking system, their enterprises, uh, how to produce. Uh, not civil goods, but military goods. They trained schools, they uh, um, repaired shelters. So there was a huge, massive program, but especially focused on the economy. What do we do if we are cut off from SWIFT, that banking system mm -hmm. worldwide? What do we do if we have no internet? So yeah. they tried and tested, they tried and tested. So they were, they were ready for they this ready. scenario. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, do, do, do you have any and questions? one more thing, oh, yeah. we should not forget. <laughs> Russia has partners, some say allies, yeah. other countries, countries like... We will talk we about will that. We will talk about yeah. that. Yeah. We will yeah. talk about that. Don't but give the game is, away yet. Oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> but this is part of the answer to your question. Yeah. There okay. are countries that help Russia survive economically. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, there's just been a few comments, and people are still talking about the election in quotation marks. Some people pushing back and a little bit of back and forth, inevitably. Um, but John Hoover, uh, also touching on what you talked about in terms of the difference between the Russian state and the USSR, uh, saying Putin and Putin's regime represents, in my opinion, he says, the last gasp of the Soviet era. So that's one way of of looking at things. But the other things are in regards to the economy, and I know you will probably want to bring in Richard yeah. at this point, right? I do. I'm, I really wanted to ask him, um, do you have a question for him? Because I'm just, uh, Richard, thanks very much for, for being patient with us. But it was something that Roman mentioned. It's been, it's been fascinating for me as well, just, to, just to listen. It's, it it's is. I mean, we, we could be listening Sorry. to him, I yeah. think, for hours and just with our mouths open yeah. going, wow. Um, but something that he did just mention which was the word sanctions. Um, weren't they supposed to cripple Russia? Why has that not succeeded? Yeah, it's funny. I mean, what Roman referred to there, the nuclear option, you know, that, that was used with, with respect to, um, to several of the sanctions that came into force. I remember that when um, the SWIFT payment system, which is based here in Europe, where, when Russia was cut out of that, that the, the nuclear option was, was one of the things that was referred to there. But I think, as Rowan mentioned, I mean, Russia has been able to adapt. It's had some flexibility. Um, and that relates partly to, I think, quite good professional management of some of its institutions, like you mentioned there, that there are some technocrats uh, in important positions, particularly the central bank, who, where the West, I remember, you know, in the early days of the war, there was some kind of naive hope in the West that, you know, these technocrats would, at some point, they, they would sort of jump ship. They would think, you know, I'm not going to play any part in this. I'm a technocrat. But technocrats are good at this stuff, yeah? And if you manage to persuade them to stay, um, they can do a good job. So, so there's been some good management within uh, the Russian system that Putin has been able to benefit from, but then also there has been the ability to kind of switch to an extent. And this kind of plays into what you just kind of teased a little bit there, I mean, which is, you know, the fact that Russia has friends in the world uh, and number one on the list there is China. Yeah, Richard, I was going to say that um, I've covered sanctions before when I was covering North Korea, when I was based in <laughs> Beijing. And the thing is, sanctions, sanctions, sanctions. And at some point you see these regimes endure. Uh, there are limits to sanctions. That's one of the biggest takeaways I had in terms of observing North Korea, Iran, and now with Russia, right? Absolutely. Um, maybe just one example on uh, sanctions. Um, there were, um, if you ask me, too many loopholes or exceptions of those uh, sanctions. So Russia was able to um, have a big chest of money thanks to uh, oil and gas revenues. Part of that was frozen. But what happened even before that war? Um, Russia stopped pumping gas to Germany through Nord Stream. 
prices went higher and higher and higher. So Russia earned a lot of money due to price just skyrocketing. And it was able to absorb that first sh shock when the West um, froze the assets. Uh, and there was a lot um, left in Russia still. A lot of money that were uh, years and years and years were collected just for this, for this war. We know now why Putin was saving. He was yeah. saving for decades for this big war. Now he's spending. And um, there were loopholes as well. So we're still buying gas, gas and ru uh, Russian gas, uh, not uh, through pipelines, but um, LNG gas. Um, um, uh, we still are buying um, oil from Russia. By we, I mean the West. Yeah. And um, this, this uh, we just cannot afford. We made ourselves very dependable on Russian resources. I mean, and yeah. there are other things like uh, atomic energy. Right. We often forget about that and other stuff. Uh, Russia is a superpower in um, agricultural products. Yeah. Now selling to the world uh, grain, it uh, grows on the occupied territories as well. Yeah. I just want to say that there's comments about this right now. We have at uh, Saikarthi Ayer saying that Germany has um, been buying oil and gas um, from, from Russia and uh, this has created what this person calls the current monster of Russia. Um, never forget and hide the truth, uh, he or she or they say, and, and, say, and pointing out that EU still remains the best ally by still buying energy from Russia. And we also have someone, uh, Kyle Lippincott, saying, will Russian oil processing facilities affect Indian oil? oil imports. I believe India was buying the majority of Russian oil after sanctions, and now the drone strikes that have hit 10 percent of Russia's oil refining facilities uh, could potentially impact the flow. Um, I don't know if that's a question in terms of Russia's sale to India. Well, well, let, let me, let me yeah. jump in here yeah. to, to just show you guys, like, we have a graph um, that kind of shows how much the trade volume with Russia for both uh, India and China um, uh, went up. Um, for, for, uh, for China, it looks uh, like a smaller increase, but the, these increases are pretty significant, right? Like you need to, um, uh, like usually these graphs go, go up like that uh, in terms of trade volume, you know? And that's a pretty significant jump. And especially for India in this case, um, it is a lot of oil that they're buying from um, from the Russian um, state, from the Russian government. And yeah. let me just, sorry to interrupt, okay. just, I'd love to hear from Richard on this actually, about overall trade. Oh, sorry, sorry, do you have more? No, oh. I just realized uh, this is actually, uh, you might realize that this is uh, looking, uh, you guys watching is what I mean, um, uh, that this is kind of a screenshot from YouTube that's a part of an explainer on the Russian economics, which we can also link in the uh, comments. I just wanted to mention that. Okay, thank you very much. That in there, right? Yeah. <laughs> I, I just wanted to make uh, to get um, Richard back in on this to talk about overall trade and how important for Russia, uh, China and India have been something that Roman was uh, obviously alluding to a little bit earlier. But but what's your take on it, yeah. Richard? Yeah, definitely very important. I mean, we should just say about that graph. I don't know if we can just pull that up again, just just to clarify, because because the way you need to know that. That is a, a kind of a proportional graph. So we see it, 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 it don't make the mistake of thinking that Indian trade with Russia is like four times China's trade with Russia. That is the, the, a four times increase uh, mm -hmm. over that period. Yeah. So, so j j just to be clear about what that means there, you know, that there's been a, a dramatic in increase with India. And certainly there has been. And the Indians got a lot of criticism for that, especially in the first year of the war from Western partners saying, you know, what are you doing buying all of this Russian oil? And the, the Indians have said, you know, simply said, look, we're a poor country. Uh, we look on the global market and try and get the best deal for our people. Um, don't blame us for what's going on um, in Europe. And that, in a way, is a kind of like a, a little kind of refraction of India's overall view to, towards the war, um, because India's a long-standing friend of Russia. They have ties that go back uh, to the Cold War period. Russia has been a long-time provider of arms to, to India. It's the, it's the primary, has been the primary uh, provision, provider of arms to India over many years. It also provided India with all sorts of diplomatic cover at the United Nations over the years. So they have ties that really go back quite a long way. Um, but it is complicated, that's for sure. But just one more thing on, the, on, this, on this issue of, of, of the sanctions and, and the, the reorientation of the, of the Russian economy. Um, you know, from the one point of view, you can sort of say, well, the EU has pretty much sort of failed because it hasn't been able to completely decimate Russia's uh, 
income from um, from hydrocarbons. But it is quite remarkable the extent to which the EU was able to go not quite cold turkey, but very nearly um, from from Russian oil and gas. So I was just looking up the figures. I'm, I see Dustin nodding. He probably knows these <laughs> figures too. But you know, in early 2022, just before the invasion, the European Union was importing fossil fuels worth $16 billion per month, $16 billion per month. Um, and that reduced to $1 billion per month by the end of 2023. Wow. So that's, I mean, that's an absolutely massive uh, reduction. And yeah, and what uh, Russia has been able to do to a large extent is simply reorientate those exports, uh, particularly in the case of oil, which of course is a, a relatively simple commodity to export. You put it in a ship and you send it somewhere. But since then, there's been a period of, of the West, particularly the G7, constantly trying to kind of uh, um, catch up with, with what Russia is doing, trying to kind of balance various goals. They want to, on the one hand, they want to make sure that they are buying as little as possible themselves. They do not want to be seen as funding Putin's war. Um, but on the other hand, uh, they don't necessarily want to stop everybody from buying these, uh, from well, buying Russian oil, because they are scared that that could cause a massive leap in global prices. Well, so Richard, what they've done is they've tried to bring about mechanisms to cap prices. Um, well, Richard, I just want to bring in a comment here because uh, John Hoover is making a good point about this um, with regard to sanctions. He says, I was in Uzbekistan last year and the products and materials uh, are traded with non-sanctioned countries and sold or delivered into Russia. And, and he saw this in uh, Uzbekistan, Central Asia. And then he also, of course, mentions the, uh, the BRICS countries as well. Yeah, 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 yeah. And and what's also interesting, we're talking about Central Asia, that Central Asia has been a conduit for basically great imports uh, into Russia. I'm sure Roman can say something about this, but but basically things like, you know, German cars, the kind of stuff that wealthy Russians love, you know, a wealthy Russian uh, is still going to want their big Mercedes, their Maybach, their Porsche, um, despite this war. So they're going to find ways and it's fascinating to see that there's been a huge jump in exports from Germany to countries in Central Asia, which are then, the assumption is, are then kind of sending those on to Russia in a way that, that avoids um, sanctions. Because all the Georgia, Cossacks are certainly, um, are suddenly very interested in German automobiles by 200% <laughs> or something, right? Yeah, like exactly. I mean, you've seen really dramatic increases that, 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 that stretch the credibility that suddenly the people of Kyrgyzstan, of Kazakhstan, of Tajikistan have developed such a taste for a, a German luxury cars. Although the leaders of many of those countries, of course, do famously have taste for German luxury cars. But just also, I mean, from personal experience also, I was in Georgia uh, last year, you know, in the Caucasus. Um, and if you go up into the mountains near the border with Russia in Georgia, you, you come across a huge line of trucks waiting to go through the border there. And when I say huge, I mean, it takes like half an hour to overtake them that huge. Like they go, it goes on for kilometer after kilometer after kilometer. And this is also seen as a kind of a gray um, import uh, uh, route that is being taken advantage of um, by actors out there who are just looking for ways to circumvent sanctions. And that's the nature of sanctions. Yeah, I mean, the, you know, if you put a constraint on a country people will try to find a way around it. And I think it's good what you said, Melissa, earlier about kind of comparisons historically about what sanctions have really yielded results. I mean, if you look at the case of North Korea, how many sanctions have been on North Korea for so long? It's still there. And that regime is still there. <laughs> still true. developing further nuclear weapons. And now it's They're a nuclear state too. Yeah. So, okay, well... And, and okay. I mean, I think there's there's one example that I think uh, which goes back to my time in the U.S. when I was there several years ago at the time that the U Iran nuclear deal was being negotiated, and there was a there was a sense during that time that Iran sanctions managed to push Iran to the point of hyperinflation, and mm. this actually was part mm. of the motivator for uh, for Iran um, going ahead and agreeing to the to the Iran nuclear deal. Um, so that's the kind of scale of disruption that you need to achieve with sanctions, really. Hyperinflation, something that, 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 that threatens the explosion of the political and economic yeah. order in a country. Yeah. Of course, uh, Russia is very, very, it's got high inflation, but it's very far from that. Yeah.
Thank you so much, Richard. Yeah, we could talk about this for a long time. Um, you, Let me cut in everybody, for one really just, wants to talk oh, no. on this subject. I just <laughs> want to say I'll share the link. Uh, uh, Richard was right when he said I know these numbers that he was talking about. I'll share a link to these numbers in the chat if okay. you guys want to follow along at home. Thank you. Um, I know you want to say probably a bit more about that, but we just need to move on because I want to uh, bring in Cherry now, Cherry Chan, who's been uh, really concentrating on the chat along with Melissa, but just to get an idea of what the feeling is in the chat so far. Yeah, um, I've been looking at the chat and I find it quite interesting that some people actually mentioned this point of um, immortality and talked about Putin's age. Actually, they were oh. um, raising questions about um, that now Putin is the dictator, and but after his death, who will continue this dictatorship? And they are just um, trying to guess what will happen after that. And uh, some people also point out that, um, going back to the economic um, problems that we mentioned before, that um, even though um, Putin is a dictator, but then they point out that he is actually um, he makes Russia stronger and economically better. So that's also um, the opposite of the opinion that we often hear. Yeah, absolutely. OK, thank you very much. If you are joining us, you are watching News Desk. It's a live stream and this week we are looking at this, how Putin's grasp on Russia is reshaping the world order. And I think it would be a good moment now to listen or, and watch uh, a... Um, a, a little sot, we call it, so a, a clip from President Xi of China. Back in 2019, he's standing back, uh, standing next to uh, President Putin, and he's talking about their friendship, their relationship. Let's just watch that, and then um, I'd love to get your reactions, Richard and also Roman. Mr. Putin and I have established tight working contacts and a solid friendship. We have met almost 30 times in the last six years. Russia is the foreign country I've visited the most. And President Putin, for me, is my best friend and a good colleague. So quite, I, I find that quite an extraordinary clip of just what these um, two dictators, I think we can say, um, are how they are referring to one another. Richard, if I just come to you first, because I know that you've spent a lot of time um, researching and looking into the relationship between Putin and Xi for your own uh, YouTube documentary at 4DW, um, and which, by the way, has got more than two million hits, so maybe we can pop that into the chat as well, I so you can take a look right at that for anyone who's interested. But how close do you think they really are? Are they soulmates, or is this purely transactional yeah well I, I think soulmates is is going a little bit far but <laughs> but I mean I think that yeah we we included that that clip in the the documentary that you referred to and there's there's another kind of legendary one that happened a couple of years after that um, that I think a lot of viewers will probably remember and it was just before Putin launched his war against Ukraine um, and he went to Beijing because uh, that Beijing was holding the Winter Olympics. So this was February 2022. Um, and the two men met um, and they announced what they referred to as a partnership without limits. Um, that the, they were stepping up the relationship between their, their two countries to, to a kind of a new level. Um, and then just within the space of a week or two after that, uh, Vladimir Putin launched his war. And there's been a lot of speculation to, about what to what extent Putin might have kind of warned Xi Jinping that, that he was really going to do this. A lot of discussion about that. But um, there have been these moments that have really encapsulated just how close uh, these men have become. It's quite interesting, like the Chinese, often when you talk to them about this and no limits and you ask them, what does this mean, a partnership without limits? And they sort of say, often they will try to play it down and say, you know, I mean, of course we say it's without limits. That's just a polite thing to say. But um, of course, we have to take it seriously. And and I think what you've essentially, I think basically the kind of bottom line to think about with Vladimir Putin and Xi Jinping is that they look at the objectives that they want to achieve for their countries respectively. And they think about what is standing in my way of achieving those objectives. And they come to the same answer that it's the United States. 
And that is really the kind of the, the common understanding of the world and perception of their situation and what they want to achieve while standing in their way that, that links them. So that, that's, and that's at the that heart of it. You mean at the heart of it is sort of the hatred, hatred for the United States, you mean? Is that what you mean, Richard? I, I, I mean, I, I think, you know, in the case of Vladimir Putin, that's probably <laughs> developed into something like a hatred. I'm not sure that's necessarily the case with Xi Jinping. I'd be curious to see what Melissa says about that. But Xi Jinping often sort of reminisces about a a, 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 a visit to Midwestern United States when he was. <laughs> that kind of that up was at the coming. beginning of his leadership, and then I think the tone. Uh, that was at the beginning yeah. of Xi Jinping's leadership when he would reminisce about yeah. his trip to the Midwest, but yeah. he has not spoken as much yeah. in that uh, light. I just want to share some comments um, in regards to what was uh, you just discussed. Uh, um, I can't. Pr this is your your name is too wild. Your name is too <laughs> wild. But uh, Mr. Psychotic Wiki uh, says, "Bring on the multipolar world." You know, definitely in regards to uh, China and Russia's partnership and the view that the United States, the uh, unipolar superpower, uh, is the problem. And then there's a question, maybe for for both of you, um, whoever wants to answer it, uh, asking, "How does China's Silk and Road economic belt uh, and the 21st century mar maritime silk?" Road uh, figure into Russia-China relations. That's a really meaty question. Um, and maybe Richard can present the Chinese point of view and Roman the Russian point of view on that. <laughs> yeah, Roman I mean, first, I, or Richard? I, I, I Richard. Think, I think you can look at Belt and Road in various different ways. You know, on the one hand, it's been looked at as as a means for. Um, the Chinese economy to to develop for it to you know for, for Chinese contractors for Chinese engineers for Chinese companies to go out there and build infrastructure in the world to have an outlet for this huge kind of development of this inter infrastructure industry which, which came up in in China over the last 20 years or so but also it's about political objectives. It's about trying to build a network of political relationships and also dependencies around the world um, that of course the United States has a massive lead on. I mean, the United States, its biggest strength is its network of allies, which goes of course far beyond even just any you know, having a bridge built in your country. Um, but but China is kind of just starting out in that, you know, that China hasn't had that. Um, so with Belt and Road, you see the sort of early days of that. And, you know, it's been, it's a Xi Jinping project. It's been going for a, a decade or so. You know, there's been a lot of talk recently about it. it's kind of hitting bumps in the road. And, you know, the, it certainly has um, kind of uh, a mixed reception in many of the countries. You know, there's been a lot of talk of it, it creating, um, you know, debt traps for the countries, the, the goals of it, that are the targets of it. Um, but But that's really part of the part of the program. And I think you can start to see the way that this interlinks into other objectives in the way that um, China, for instance, is trying to uh, uh, grow its influence within the United Nations system. So for instance, the United Nations has this body called the U UN Human Rights Council. China is a member of that. And, um, you know, it is trying to kind of move the, the Human Rights Council towards a definition of human rights that is one that's more compatible with the Chinese regime, which is, of course, one that we know is very repressive, um, and instead redefining human rights as something that's about um, you know, having a, a, a economic matters, that you know, it's the right not to be poor and things like that. And you can see that as it tries to bring motions like that uh, through UN bodies that it is looking for countries to support it in these in these movements and you can there you start to see the logic of having this kind of network of political dependencies and and uh, economic dependencies around the world because you can start leaning on these countries and saying yeah if you want the next railway if you want the next bridge well how's about supporting us on on this or that and let me just bring in Roman. Yes. What's your point of view? And also, sorry, this 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 comment just flows straight from Richard okay, to Roman. Yeah. Um, the, the comment is the roles between China and Russia have changed too. Back in the day, Russia was the big brother, but over the years, China has become the big brother, particularly uh, after uh, the invasion of Ukraine. In, in fact, I could say uh, with a lot of confidence that among the China experts in the world, uh, there is a feeling that Russia has become a vassal state. 
Well, there is this point of view, yes. Of course, definitely Russia is a weaker partner if you're talking about a partnership between Russia and China. Um, economically, if, if we're talking about the Silk Road, Russia maybe is not that important that it might seem because basically it's about trade, trade between East and West. Russia sees itself in war with the West. So this is how Putin explains it. He says the West attacked us and we had to react. Uh, pushing the West back on the Ukrainian territory. This is this is what he is telling. Uh, but uh, I think that Putin would never have risked this war without knowing that when it, it comes to the worst, China would back him up. Yeah. So uh, he definitely, I think, spoke about it. He so the Chinese leader knew about this war coming, this big war. I'm talking about what happened in 2022, and of course, um, Putin is feels very comfortable with that. So um, I, I don't think we can know all the details of the relationship. If it's a true friendship, uh, uh, the resentment against the West, the USA, uh, or uh, what's, what's at the core of it. But um, they do have a similar vision. Uh, they do have a similar vision. I think that vision is um, a world without Western domination. Yeah. But um, they are, um, it's, it's interesting because uh, Russia is very much dependent on China, and China is dependent on the West still. Yes. Because the relations between uh, China and the West are much, much stronger than they ever have been between Russia and the West. So if that changes, yeah. that will be yeah. the big catalyst then. Yes. I mean, I would like to ask you both, maybe you, Richard, first. Uh, do you think that Russia and China together, they both have nuclear weapons, for example, are they an actual threat to the West, do you think? Well, um, I think you can certainly say that Russia is currently a threat to Europe. I mean, I think that that's uh, almost uh, stating the obvious um, at this stage. It's obviously a threat to Ukraine. It's invading Ukraine. Um, and there have been implicit threats uh, made by the Russians towards Moldova, towards the Baltic states. Um, you know, th there's a lot of concern um, in Eastern Europe about if Vladimir Putin were to achieve his goals of completely uh, uh, dominating Ukraine, what's next? Um, and with respect to China, I mean, and he you start to, and this is an, a whole big conversation of its own, but he you start to kind of come to the, the differences between the European and the US perceptions of what is the challenge of China. Now, the Europeans, and particularly the Germans, over the last 15, 20 years, most of the time, they looked at China and thought, great, this is a place that we can do business with. And, you know, German industry um, has uh, become highly intertwined with, with China. Um, you know, the German car industry sells a huge proportion of its cars into China. Um, so China, for a long time, was seen by the Europeans as primarily an opportunity. And in the United States, there was to an extent, this, this perception as well, but, but the United States has more quickly pivoted from that. And, the, and it's an open question of how far uh, Europe is gonna go with that. But for the United States, they look at China and they see a country that wants to dominate Asia. And the United States has alliances in Asia, you know, it has alliances with many of the most important countries in Asia. They are feeling intimidated by China um, and you know, there are various flashpoints where there could be there's a very realistic and serious prospect of a war between the United States and China. And obviously one that we talk about a lot is Taiwan. And Taiwan, of course, the parallels between Xi Jinping and Vladimir Putin and Taiwan and Ukraine um, are kind of pretty plain to see. I mean, there are significant differences as well, of course. You know, Ukraine is recognized in the United Nations as a sovereign state. Um, Taiwan is not, but that, of course, makes Taiwan's position potentially all the more precarious. And yet the United States has more significant defense commitments that go back much longer with Taiwan than it ever did to Ukraine. Um, and Taiwan's so, economy is much larger than Ukraine's. To, to, yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah. The 13th Taiwan's largest economy, economy highly, I think. Yeah, Taiwan's economy is, ver is large and it's highly advanced and it also is, is absolutely critical on one of the most important areas of technology right now, sort of high-performance microchips. And again, to come back to the parallels between the worldviews of Vladimir Putin and Xi Jinping, I think that what, what it gives cause for concern 
is what I was mentioning earlier about the sense of wanting to achieve something for your nation and the United States being the primary thing standing in your way. And if you look at Vladimir Putin, who appears to want to reconstitute the Russian Empire in some form, as we've been talking about, take Ukraine. Belarus is already kind of supine, but potentially there could be some sort of Anschluss with Belarus. I mean, Roma can talk about that. So that's Putin wanting to reclaim something that he sees as his. And that's what Xi Jinping wants to do with Taiwan. He said over and over again that he reserves the right to invade Taiwan. Um, he has said over and over again that uh, what he would see is the reunification of Taiwan with mainland China um, being uh, part of the rejuvenation of the Chinese nation, which is the overarching mission that he and the Chinese Com Communist Party has. And plus the fact that Xi Jinping, like uh, Vladimir Putin, has very much personalized control over China. It has gone in China from from a system that, that and Melissa can, has, has much more deep knowledge of this, but the Chinese system that was much more of a, a collective run by the party, not by an individual for, for a long period of since Mao really, um, that has now all changed. And I've spoken to people in China who are concerned about that, you know, people who may be you know, supporters of the con Chinese Communist Party, but they're worried now that too much power has been consolidated in one fallible person. So there are a lot of parallels, going back to this sort of parallels issue. And I think the biggest worry of all is, yeah, what's going to happen over Taiwan in the next few years? Thank you very much, Richard. Um, just to say hello to everybody who is joining us. Uh, we're News Desk and we are this week asking how Putin's grasp on Russia is reshaping the world order. We've just spent quite a bit of time talking about China and um, President Xi's relationship with President Putin. But I would really like to move on now quickly to India and to find out, Richard, again, if I can come to you, where you think India fits in uh, with all this, because we know, as you alluded to before, that India has good relations with Russia and always has in the past, but does not have good relations uh, with China. So where does, uh, where are we with India in terms of the three countries, Russia, China, India? Yeah, so India, I mean, the position of India is really fascinating. Um, and, you know, we've referred to it already that it has a long-standing relationship with Russia um, and that it has increased its oil imports from Russia since the war began. Um, but at the same time, it has an extremely fraught relationship with China. Um, and there have been, you know, on, an, on again, off again tensions between the two countries, you know, over a long period. But the, the kind of serious worsening in, relationship, in the relationship uh, started four years ago or so when there was a clash between their um, militaries uh, along their uh, border in the Himalayas. Now, their border in the Himalayas, so this is high in the mountains, it's extremely remote. But this is the longest disputed land border in the world. Um, and to give you a sense of the, the degree to which it's disputed, I mean, China claims an entire uh, Indian state, Arunachal Pradesh, it's called. It's in, it's in the East Himalayas uh, near the border with Myanmar. China says, uh, this is southern Tibet. This belongs to us. This shouldn't be part of uh, India. And this is a kind of a colonial relic that it was even assigned to India, you know, at all. Um, so very serious disputes there. And this flared up four years ago. And essentially what you've had is the Chinese putting pressure there. And you've got massive military uh, buildups on both sides of that border. And you have both sides and it's essentially came at sort of China's prompting, but India is trying to kind of keep up with it, trying to, you know, build out infrastructure, military installations, try to kind of like achieve facts on the ground to make sure that they've kind of staked out, you know, what they view as, as the appropriate border. Um, there's also in India a strong sense that China is trying to encircle it in the Indian Ocean, that it's making friends with um, countries all around it, 
China has a long-standing friendship with Pakistan, which is India's, of course, sworn enemy. Um, Pakistan is one of the main parts of the Belt and Road Initiative that we were talking about earlier. You know, for instance, uh, the Chinese have been developing a port called Gwadar, which gives it access to the Indian Ocean. You know, this is extremely valuable to uh, China. But China's also been making friends with Sri Lanka, with Bangladesh, with Nepal, to try to kind of, from the point of view of India, what are you doing? This is our backyard, you know? Um, so, so there's a lot of tension there. Um, and India, I mean, India's response to this is criticized by a lot of people within India saying that it's not being tough enough uh, militarily, it's not being tough enough um, uh, diplomatically. The Indians insist that they don't need anyone's help with this, although the uh, United States um, reportedly did provide intelligence during this period of uh, border clashes. Um, but India has gone further than Western countries in some areas. For instance, in response to those clashes, it banned TikTok. Yeah. And, you know, how long is this discussion? Melissa, I know you've been talking about this on your Twitter. <laughs> yes, recently. I have. Like, um, you know, it's quite extraordinary that um, it's such a struggle for the West to ban TikTok. I, I mean, mean, when you I consider believe that you India ban banned it. it a year ago, if not longer. So. No, um, no, longer ago. They banned it in if I'm memory serves in 2020 there you and go. they have wow. you know they have a huge domestic equivalent of a kind of a me too domestic product of it now called Josh which is a huge success um but uh yeah I mean the, the United the West could the United States could ban TikTok as a matter of sheer re reciprocity because Facebook and Twitter and co are not uh, available in China so why just should they allow fact, TikTok into, just a fun fact into, yeah. at some point Google was the number one search engine in China so that 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 tells you how much that China like essentially just yeah. killed uh, yeah. you know the foreign uh, the yeah. product in order to allow their their product to thrive. Uh, Richard, as you were talking, I just want to share some of the comments in regards to the India aspect to this. Um, and yes, Alex as do. well. Uh, at, at Demon Sarkar saying India has reduced their military dependencies on Russia and is focusing on the make. Uh, made in India or Make in India initiative, uh, perhaps this is one way for India to hedge this very difficult relationship that it has to uh, that it has with Russia and also with the United States. Yeah, because yeah. I mean, I think yeah, that's to, just to pick up on that directly. Um, yeah, I mean, this process of India trying to diversify its um, its sources of arms. Uh, has been going on for a little while now. I think there's there's an understanding in India that it has an excess dependency there. Um, and of course, particularly that Russia's war against Ukraine has meant that Russia's war eco economy is devoted highly towards its own war. And, you know, any, um, you know, uh, customers seeking weapon systems or, or parts in the future are, are very likely to come second to that. So you've seen India diversifying particularly to France as, a, as an important um, uh, weapon supplier, but also saying to the United States, which would love to, you know, get India more on board uh, in a kind of a, you know, a, a push of the democracies against Russia and China, saying to the United States, well, if you want us, we want uh, it, uh, we want you to provide us not just with the weapons, but also the technology behind them and the ability to manufacture them here in India. Because as the viewer there said, that's an important priority of the government. And more and more, the United States are going along with that and saying, OK, yeah, you can build this jet engine in uh, India and we will help you do that. Um, but India is still very much in play. You know, it's the, the, it's kind of stuck in the middle between Russia and China. It doesn't want Changing to cut off Russia because, yeah, because it doesn't want to cut off relations with Russia because it feels that Russia is its one kind of protector against China, you know, pushing too far, that it wants to stay friendly with a, with a country that's, that, that's friendly with China. But at some point, that may not work out any longer. Um, at some point, Russia may become so dependent on China that it is no longer able to kind of put some kind of word in. And there's not really much of evidence that Russia has ever put word in anyway for India um, with China. Um, but at the same time, India does not want to kind of join some kind of alliance like with the United States. Um, it views itself as, you know, a rising civilization of its own. You know, it's too big to be part of an alliance. So, so what the Indians always kind of essentially see themselves as a country that can kind of take and 
pick and choose its friends and have good relationships with as many countries as possible, which means that you end up with India that is in the quad, which is a grouping with the United States and Japan and Australia at the same time as being in the BRICS, which is uh, dominated by China and uh, with Russia by its side. Um, Richard, thank you. I just love um, to, to get your a, a, a take on that, Roman, because um, obviously we, they've just been talking a lot about India. Before that, we were talking about China and our question or our, to our topic has been how Putin's grasp on Russia is reshaping the world order. Can you give us, in a very short amount of time, your take on that, how, how it is reshaping the world order, given those relationships with... We know there are other countries as well, but particularly with China and India. Well, um, in short, I think it's important to understand that uh, Russia is a revisionist power, very strong, very long underestimated, and its goal is not just to conquer Ukraine or destroy Ukraine. It's much brighter than that. Uh, let's remember that document that Russia published a few months before the invasion, demanding NATO to pull back from Central and Eastern Europe, uh, demanding basically to revise the NATO um, Eastern enlargement. Um, so uh, if we're talking about Putin, we have to understand. Uh, he wants to replay, rematch, call it what you may, uh, uh, the the collapse of the Soviet Union, not just that, but uh, the lo loss of influence of Moscow in Central and Eastern Europe. Mm. This is the goal. And the way to achieve that goal is this war, which will continue, I think. And uh, other countries, as I've just mentioned, like Moldova, former Soviet republics are also in danger. Belarus is practically, uh, has lost its independence. We have now Russian nuclear weapons stationed there, army there. Russia uses Belarus to attack Ukraine, or used to, and will probably do it again. Uh, speaking about alliances, uh, Russia wants, Russia actually smells the weakness of the West. Mm -hmm. And uh, Russia tested the West also. It was not just uh, Ukraine, it was Georgia, 2008. After that, we had a reset policy between the United States and Russia. So uh, the West, the United States, as the leading power in the West, showed we are ready to do business again. Germany was building Nord Stream 2. Yeah. Uh, uh, there are also other, other examples, like Afghanistan. Uh, the the uh, NATO actually failed in Afghanistan. Russia saw that, of course. Uh, and uh, things like Brexit, things like uh, Trump presidency in the United States, those were interpreted by Russia as signs that uh, the West has... Uh, the best times of the West are over. Now we are coming, of course, we, Russia, China, India, other countries, BRICS countries. Remember this year, 2024, as we are talking, uh, uh, that alliance, uh, Brazil, Russia, India, China and South Africa, that alliance just doubled with new countries coming like Iran, Egypt, uh, Saudi Arabia. So uh, this is how Russia wants to shape the world. Mm. And they are not talking about global south. They are talking about global majority. This is the yeah. term they use in Russia. So um, if we're talking about uh, Russian vision for the world, the vision is there is this alliance of powers. First of all, Russia, China. Uh, India is probably number three on Russia's wish list, but we don't know if that works at the moment. But there are also others, North Korea. Never forget that. Yeah. Uh, and, um, of course, Russia will be trying to, 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 uh, to do more structural work. So we, we are seeing that already. So organizations that were there are being expanded. Um, countries like Turkey, which is actually a NATO country, but uh, it has a very, uh, well, um, interesting Russia policy, I would say. <laughs> Uh, working with Russia together, buying weapons by Russia, uh, from Russia. So this is the way. Russia is trying to push NATO out of Eastern and Central Europe. It, it, it is ready to watch the Western decay. Some Russian analysts, uh, top thinkers, uh, hawks, are saying we don't have to push the West, actually. It will die on, it, on its own. So we're just watching it. It's this decay. Yeah. And, and unfortunately, there are signs of that. But I don't think this fight is over yet. Yeah, thank you so much, Roman. Absolutely fascinating. And thank you, Richard, as well. Um, we did have a poll that was uh, running right at the beginning of our stream. And Sherry, you will remind us of what the question is and tell us what the results are, please, because I am quite interested to see what those are. Yeah, we have actually quite many people voting um, in the poll that was closed about 10 minutes ago. Um, so we have 925 votes. Mm -hmm. 
Um, it's actually a very tight race because 39%. Um, what, what was the question, first of oh, all? I'm sorry, yeah, the question was, <laughs> are Russia's warming ties with China built to last? Um, we had three options. Um, the first one, the, the runner coming out is... Um, Yes, for New World Order, uh, we got 39%. And um, very close to the first one is um, the third option, which is as long as Putin and Xi are in power. And the very last one, which actually also got 25%, is no. It's all about economy, stupid. <laughs> Thanks Thank to all of you for voting. Yeah, thank you very much for that. Um, absolutely fascinating conversation, which I wish that we could um, spend much longer discussing. But I think that really we have come to the end of uh, this stream. Anyway, thank you very much, Roman, for joining us. Thank you very much to Richard down the line for all your insights as well. Really appreciated it. Thank you to Melissa. Thank you to Dustin. Thank you to Cherry. Thank you also to Michelle, who you can't see, who's in our control room. And especially thank you to all of you for watching. We will see you again next week. Check out the community tab for the topic that we'll be discussing a week from today. See you then. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.